9 is for biodiversity with Rachel and Handy. Let's start by presenting the B9 policy. The first read of it can be confusing, but there are a few words that are key for understanding the policy, and these are the words we will focus on in these short videos. So, what do we mean by critical natural habitat and natural habitat? How do we know what we have and where they are? The term critical natural habitat covers two types of area. First, it applies to existing and proposed protected areas. This covers national protected areas, Ramsar sites, World Heritage sites and core areas of biosphere reserves. It also applies to unprotected areas of known high conservation value. These are sites that have been defined nationally, regionally and internationally and include key biodiversity areas, important bird areas, Alliance for Zero Extinction sites and areas and routes important for migratory species. But what exactly are these? Key biodiversity areas are areas considered very important for biodiversity as they contain IUCN red-listed species, rare habitats and unique ecosystems. Important bird areas are areas identified as very important for the conservation of bird species. As an example, the Bahamas are considered as an IBA for this pretty goose because the islands are the only place in the world where it nests. Alliance for Zero Extinction sites are for species with only one known population in the world. These sites are their only chance for survival. An example is one small forest patch in central Chile, the only place where this frog lives. Migratory species also receive special attention as they don't obey boundaries. They need breeding sites, feeding sites and a way of getting between them. Changes in any of these areas could be disastrous and thus their whole habitat use is defined as critical natural habitat. The term natural habitat covers anywhere that is still natural and includes areas that provide ecosystem services as well as areas that allow for more valuable sites to function naturally. An example would be a biological corridor. The policy provides a long list of examples of natural habitat, but it isn't exhaustive. So, how do we know if a project site overlaps with critical natural habitat or natural habitat? IDB has its own mapping tool containing layers of spatial information on the distribution of all of the categories that I have just mentioned. This spatial information is freely available and can also be found on the web. So, if we know the proposed project location and its area of impact, we can see what it might overlap with. It's a quick and useful screening approach to give us an idea of potential impact a project could have. As an example, let us look at a project in Ecuador, a water extraction program to provide irrigation and drinking water to rural villages. We can see that the area of extraction lies within a protected area and also a key biodiversity area. Let's look for more information about the biodiversity of this site using other online resources. For this area, the Protected Planet website has lots of information. It contains a list of the species recorded in the protected area, including several IUCN red-listed frog species. These are particularly important for the B9 policy as they are very vulnerable to changes. Let's focus on one frog species, Antilopus petersi, that is critically endangered. The IUCN Red List catalogue has detailed information on this species, including a map of its distribution. We can see that even though it is very rare, at the scale of Ecuador it has a wide distribution and is not restricted to the project site. Here is another website with even more information on the species present in the protected area. As you can see, the internet has lots of useful information on biodiversity that can help us before we even make a field visit. When considering natural habitat, Remember that this category includes sites that provide ecosystem services. These are services provided by nature that are useful for us by provisioning, supporting and regulating systems, or that we value culturally and aesthetically. So we need to understand who is using the area, for what and how. To do this, we must consider the broader context of how people use the environment, the local communities who depend directly on the site for water, soil, wood, and cultural values, as well as other stakeholders. The government may have priorities for climate regulation, tourism, private companies who need water for their business, landslide prevention for farmers, and so on. 
Let's return to the example from Ecuador. We can see that this site is critical natural habitat, as it falls within a protected area and a key biodiversity area. There are threatened amphibian species in the area, and it is part of an important biological corridor between the national parks of Yangantes and Sangai. The site is in a forested watershed, and this forest cover ensures that ecosystem services such as water availability, nutrients for agriculture, and protection from flash floods are provided to communities downstream. We were lucky with our example, as the project site occurs in an area that has been studied in depth. This isn't always the case. Latin America is one of the most biodiverse areas in the world, and there is still much to learn about its biodiversity. The datasets we discussed earlier are not perfect, and don't exist for every site. And so even if the project site does not immediately appear to overlap with critical natural habitat or natural habitat, it is worth asking for expert opinion. It may be that the area has not been well studied, rather than it is not important, Biodiversity experts like being asked for their opinion, so use this valuable resource.